ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of Truth. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these. Good morning, everybody. My name is Garrett McCord. I am the interim minister to students and their families here, and it is a beautiful morning to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. It, worship was so wonderful. It was such a blessing. I, I just love getting to gather together in worship. Uh, I love worship music, and it actually reminds me of a story that I heard from an author named J.D. Greer in one of his books. And basically, there's this Christian singer, and she rents some time at a recording studio to record a song. And so the day comes when they've booked it for, and they go in, and they get everything started up, they do the sound check, they do everything beforehand, and, and then they start to perform this first song. And the sound tech hears it, he's like, oh, it sounds great, everything's going well. And then the artist, about halfway through the first verse, just stops. And she throws her hands up and she goes, no, it's no use, turn it off, he's just not here. And the sound tech is obviously confused because he thought everybody showed up. And he's like, uh, ma'am, who's not here? And then the artist responds and goes, it's the Holy Spirit, his presence is just missing. And so she calls in a few friends to the studio and they start to pray over the equipment, lay hands on it, like actually like pour oil over it. Um, and they do all this and it goes on for a little bit and then they start back up only to stop like another 30 seconds in. And then she goes, stop, 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 he's not here, let's pray again, right? And so there's like 15 minutes of walking around the room, the people come back in, they're praying over things, they're, they're shouting and, and they're, they're just really trying to, trying to conjure up the Holy Spirit, right? And then this happens like four more times, right? And by the fourth time the coat comes around, the sound tech is starting to get a little bit annoyed, right? Because he's like, look, there's people behind you. Like, like my, oil, my equipment's like starting to drip with oil. Like we got to cut with the anointing stuff. And, and so they start back up for the fourth time. And as they start back up, the sound tech notices that, that one of the slides on the soundboard is down just a little bit. And so he goes and pushes it up, and immediately the worship artist is like, Holy Spirit is here, praise God, hallelujah, it is fantastic. And the sound tech comes in and goes, uh, uh, no, ma'am, that was just the reverb. Um, and the thing is, we can, we can hear that story, and we can chuckle, and not to make light of anybody, um, we think it's kind of ridiculous, but, but sometimes we can treat the Holy Spirit in the same way. Right, like maybe not to that extreme, but if you're honest, when you think of the Holy Spirit, a lot of times we conjure up these ideas of this mystical, mysterious, powerful force. Maybe we equate it to like Star Wars, right? Like the force gives us powers and there's some people who are good at using the force and then people who are like weaker, they're like the Holy Spirit pad ones or something. And the problem, is, I got one Star Wars fan over there. The problem is that's just not what you see in scripture. In the last few weeks, we've been walking through a series on the Holy Spirit, and last week, Jason did a wonderful job of walking us through Ephesians 5, and we learned about how the Holy Spirit meets us in a powerful way when we gather here together as a body of believers. We would call that corporately. And while that's a very important piece of the puzzle, what we're gonna see in Scripture this morning is that it's only half of a bigger picture. Because while the Holy Spirit does meet us when we gather together in a special and powerful way, he also meets us personally as we walk through life daily. In fact, I would argue that you can't truly experience the Spirit in a corporate manner unless you're also experiencing Him in a personal manner. Think about a marriage, right? Like what if Christine and I's marriage only existed in the public sphere, right? So we go, we walk Main Street, we go to all the shops, we eat at Peggy's. Just kidding, not Peggy's, it's too expensive. We go to uh, you know, maybe, maybe uh, Mary's, that's more our style, right? And then we take pictures, post it on the Instagram. But when we go home, we go to two separate places, don't talk to each other, and spend no time together. Let me ask you, is that time in public really genuine if it doesn't overflow from our personal relationship? No, of course not. And it's the same way with the Holy Spirit. If your public experience with the Holy Spirit doesn't come from an overflow of your personal experience with him, it's all just performative. It's a show. And so this morning, we're gonna look at how we can actually experience the Holy Spirit in a real, powerful, and personal way. 
And so if you have your Bible, go ahead and flip open to John 14, verses 16 through 17. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one in the pew rack in front of you. That is our gift to you. Take that, write in it, mark in it, highlight it up. We want you to have a copy of God's word. And so as you flip there, the context of this passage in John is that it comes during Jesus's farewell address to his disciples at the Last Supper, right? They've walked through him for three years, or they've walked with him through three years of ministry, right? And it's been, they've seen miracles and wonders and amazing things, and it's all coming to this crescendo when he tells them he's gonna leave. He's about to be betrayed, falsely accused, and crucified. But he spends his last moments comforting the very people who had abandoned him in the middle of his darkest moment. And how he comforts them is he ensures them that the Father is going to send a helper to be with them through every single trial that they're about to go through. So let's go ahead and read, starting in verse 16. It says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, so that he may be with you forever. The helper is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he remains with you and will be in you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you that that we can just gather together, Lord, and learn more about who you are through how you've revealed yourself in scripture. And so I pray that you would open our eyes to your truth this morning. You would remove all the distractions that can keep us from seeing who you are and what you have for us this morning. Father, we love you and praise you in Jesus' name, amen. So this passage in scripture is one of the most clear descriptions we have of the Holy Spirit. Right, And one of the most notable things about this is just how personal Jesus' description of the Spirit is. First, look at the pronouns that he uses to describe the Spirit. He says, the Father will send a helper and he will be with you. And to save you all of the Greek, this is really important because if the, myst- if the Spirit were some mystical, powerful, unknowable force, there would be a neuter pronoun like it used, like something that's kind of inanimate and distant. But instead, Jesus uses the masculine pronoun, he. And no, I'm not saying that the Spirit's a guy in the way that we think of guys because he's a spirit, but I believe what's being implied here and the point here is to show us that the Spirit's personal and he relates to us in a personal way that we can understand as humans. And secondly, speaking of relating to us, everything Jesus says the Spirit does is personal. He says that he's a helper. Right? And to be a helper, you have to have a level of personal interaction. Right? You can't be a helper and be detached from a situation. And not only that, but he says that the Spirit's going to be another helper. Do you know who the first helper is? Jesus. And Jesus walked through three years of life with these disciples, through losses of friends, through trials, through hunger. And he says, by by saying that it's going to be another helper indicates some similarity. Obviously, there's difference there, but it shows that the Holy Spirit's going to be personal in a way that Jesus was personal with these disciples. And then, even beyond that, later in the verse, Jesus says that the Spirit will be with you forever. He will know you. He'll be in you. And those are all deeply personal, individual functions. And to top it all off, when Jesus says that the world can't receive the Spirit, what reason does he give? Because they don't know him. And guys, that's the point. The Holy Spirit is personal. He desires to have a personal relationship with us and to walk with us personally. That is his nature. That's who he is. And so to say that you experience him on Sunday mornings, on Wednesday nights, but to have no evidence of any sort of experiencing him in your personal day-to-day life makes no sense because that's not how he works. But let's be real. If you're like me, you're probably asking yourself right now, uh, how do I experience the Holy Spirit perfectly? Like, I'm more confused now than when we started. It sounds like you're just making all these new rules. I have the indwelling Holy Spirit. I thought that was enough. And, and, and there's some truth to that, because let's be honest, right? A lot of us growing up did not learn about the Spirit. In a lot of denominations and a lot of churches, the Spirit doesn't get talked about for fear of slipping into some sort of heresy or some sort of weird theology. And, and I'll admit, like, it can be complex. God meets different people in different ways. We don't wanna put him in a box, And it's one thing to know that the Spirit is personal. It's another to know how to actually meet him personally. But none of that means that we have to spend the rest of our lives chasing this thing that we have no idea how to actually take hold of. Because in Scripture, we actually see places where the Holy Spirit promises to meet every believer. 
And so with the time that we have left this morning, I just wanna walk through three of those that I think are some of the most important and some of the most universal, meaning that this goes for all believers. You can count on this. This is a promise from God. And so the first place that I wanna discuss this morning is that the Holy Spirit will meet you in the gospel. And I want to define the gospel real quick because I never want to assume the gospel. I never want to assume people know what I mean by that word, but that is the central message of Christ crucified. Right, that we were separated from God because of our sin, but he desired to save us, so he sent his son Jesus, who lived a perfect life, yet took our place on the cross and died for our sin, so that the wrath of God would be satisfied, so that if we place our faith in what he did for us on the cross, then we would be saved, that we would be adopted into the family of God, and that we would spend eternity with him. And I love how Tim Keller sums up the gospel in a sentence, he says, Through the person and work of Jesus Christ, God fully accomplishes salvation for us, rescuing us from judgment for sin into fellowship with him, and then he restores the creation in which we enjoy our new life together with him forever. And it may seem obvious at first that the Holy Spirit meets us here, right? Because we've all heard, okay, well, you hear the gospel, you get saved, you receive the Holy Spirit. It makes sense, right? And while that's true, the problem is that a lot of people stop there. It's like the gospel is good to get me saved, it's good to get me into heaven, but as soon as I'm there, it kind of gets pushed to the side, kind of gets ignored. But as a believer, you are never supposed to graduate from the truth of the gospel. You don't ever move past that basic truth. It's a lot like golf. I got some of the men in the room back in with that one. They heard golf and they're like, oh, okay, let's go. So I, the thing about golf is I'm bad at it. I'm not good. Like I, I, the only place that you're safe when I'm playing golf with you not to get hit with a golf ball is where I'm actually trying to hit the ball. Like if you're on the fairway, you are safe. Like you're not gonna get hit, I promise, right? And so I eventually ended up taking a golf course at DBU. I needed a PE credit, but I was also like, okay, I should probably try to get better at this before I just get made fun of for the rest of my life. And so I'm here and I I go the first day, we go to this course in Dallas and I'm working with the coach and he's like, Garrett, you gotta slow down. You gotta just focus on the basics and go from there. And so he backed me off. I started just working on the basic mechanics of golf. And what do you know? I ended up hitting some of my best shots that day, better than I ever had. And so the next day I came back and, and, you know, in my mind, I'm like right below Tiger at this point. I'm like ready to go. Like it was good yesterday, so I'm about to hit it a mile, like 500 yards, easy. And of course I I go and it's just awful, right? And the coach looks at me and I remember him telling me, Garrett, it's like you forgot everything that we worked on yesterday. And you're just trying to swing for the fences with every single one. I know you may think that you've moved past the basics, but the thing is you never really do. The best in the game haven't moved past the basics. They're the ones who have the deepest knowledge of them. And it struck me with that's, that's how it works with the gospel. Being a mature Christian isn't about having all of the theological head knowledge about infralapsinarianism and supralapsinarianism. And those are both real things, I promise. It's about having a deep knowledge of the gospel. It's not about seminary smarts, it's about gospel depth. And that's only accomplished through the Holy Spirit. That head knowledge isn't bad, but that should come from an overflow of knowing the gospel. Knowing the gospel is what makes you desire to learn more about God. And like I said, this is where the Holy Spirit comes in because practically this looks like preaching the gospel to yourself. Dwell on its truth, remember it. And as you do, the Holy Spirit will open your eyes more and more to the truth that you may have always known at face value, but it's amazing how he just makes the riches of the gospel come to life. And then from there, he starts to show you how it applies to your life. What do I mean by that? You feel guilt, shame about past sin, that time that you went further than you ever thought you would. The gospel says that on the cross, Jesus bore your sin, he bore your shame so that you never have to again. Struggling with sin, an addiction that you've promised you're gonna lay down 15 times, The gospel says that on the cross, Jesus destroyed the power of death and sin so that you can be free for freedom Christ has set you free. And so whether you realize it or not, you have the ability to walk out of that. Feel alone, unwanted. The gospel says that on the cross, Jesus made a way for you to be adopted as a beloved child of the most high God because he loved you. 
And I could go on and on, but the point and the truth is the gospel is for everything in our lives. And as you preach it to yourself in every moment, in every stage, in every phase of life, the Holy Spirit will meet you there and use it to comfort you, help you, and guide you. And the second place that the Holy Spirit will meet you is in Scripture, right? And so maybe you've heard it from this pulpit, maybe you've heard it from another pastor, a preacher, a Sunday school teacher, but most of us here in this room have heard, as a Christian, you better read your Bible. And it's good advice. All Scripture is God-breathed. All Scripture is useful. Blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord. Reading Scripture is essential for a healthy spiritual life. But so is how you read Scripture. Because for some people, reading scripture is just another box on their to-do list of life. I gotta scratch God's back so he scratches mine. I need that promotion, so I'm gonna make sure my devotional's really good this week. I don't wanna get like struck by lightning, so I'm just gonna, all right, God, I'm gonna take care of you, and then you take care of me, and that's a good deal, right? Or maybe it's all about gaining, like I said earlier, theological head knowledge to prove your buddy wrong in your favorite theological debate. Oh man, Jim, that Calvinist, I'm gonna show him. And the thing is, when that's your approach to reading scripture, the Bible's nothing more than a textbook. And on the other side of the spectrum is your Bible lottery approach, right? Like, I'm gonna take my Bible, I'm gonna flip it open to a random page, I'm gonna throw my finger down, and that's what God is saying to me today. And the issue in that is not only does it take everything out of its proper context, but it also makes scripture about you. And the thing is, it's not. Scripture's about God. And yes, there's principles in us as we see God and know more of who he is. There's principles there that we apply to our lives, but we can't put that cart before the horse. That's how heresies and all sorts of whack theology come to be. And so we have to find this balance. You want to read scripture in its proper context to find its proper meaning. You don't wanna just make it all about you, but you also have to read scripture with a sense of expectation, This means coming to the text and saying, okay, God, what are you gonna show me through your word today? And when you do, you're gonna be amazed at how the Holy Spirit will open your eyes to things just as you need them. And I'm not saying that he's gonna literally highlight a verse in your favorite chapter that's gonna be your exact specific situation, but the truth about scripture is scripture is more concerned with the type of person you are than the very specific ins and out choices you make during a day. And there's a reason for that, because if you submit yourself to the authority of Scripture and say, this is God's word, I'm gonna live by it, then what the Holy Spirit will do is he'll use Scripture to transform you from the inside out in a process that we call sanctification. And it means you become to look more and more like Jesus, because that's God's will for all believers. And as you look more and more like Jesus, you'll be prepared for all of life's circumstances, whatever life throws at you. And and speaking of life circumstances, that brings us to the third uh, place that the Holy Spirit will meet us, and that's that the Holy Spirit will meet you in your experiences. And I was actually scrolling through the internet the other day, and I stumbled across this quote from an author named B.J. Neblett, and that's a funny name. I I kinda chuckled when I read it, but he uh, he says that we are the sum total of our experiences. Those experiences, be they positive or negative, make us the person that we are at any given point in our lives. And at first glance, that sounds kind of believable, right? Like it sounds good, it sounds like what you may have learned in psychology class in high school. Uh, There's more and more studies that come out that show the importance of early childhood development on the type of person that that child will become later on in life. And so it sounds okay, that makes sense. But the problem is we all have experiences we would rather forget. Whether it's an absent parent, a rough home life, mental health issue, a past addiction and all the sin or all the shame and guilt that come with it, the list goes on and on. And if you think that you're a product of your experience, you feel trapped because you can never get away from that and you think that that trauma forever and ever is gonna define who you are. And can I give you some good news this morning? The Holy Spirit has better for you than that. Because if you're a Christian, you're a new creation. You're not a product of your experience. You're a product of who God says you are. And God calls you his child, his loved, forgiven, and redeemed child who is sealed by the Holy Spirit. And now the Holy Spirit will not only remind you of those truths, 
but he'll take those experiences in your life and he will use them for good. This is the truth that Paul's given us in Romans 8, 28. He says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for the good or for good. And then Paul later writes in 2 Corinthians 1 that he's writing to this Corinthian church and he's writing about comfort in times of trial and he's saying that God is showing us such great comfort so that we may take that comfort which we've received from God and give that comfort to people who are now in times of need, to comfort others with the same comfort that you received. And so if you've struggled in the past, if you've been through things, I, I am sorry but know that that doesn't have to be a gray cloud that hangs over your life for the rest of your days. God will take that and he will use that to make you a ministry and a blessing to others who are struggling with that very thing right now. The Holy Spirit will meet you there. A great example of this is a guy named Chuck Colson. Many of you may have heard of him through his prison fellowship ministry. I mean, I'd actually heard his name, but I didn't know much about him until I actually dug into his past and it blew me away. He was a White House aide for Richard Nixon, and he would actually end up landing in prison for his involvement in the Watergate scandal. And during the trial, shortly before he was actually in prison, he found the Lord, he was saved. And while he was in prison, he developed this deep concern for his fellow prisoners. And and once he was released from prison, he would start his fellowship, or his prison fellowship ministry. And, And what they did is they'd go into prisons and they'd share the gospel, They provide resources to take care of prisoners' families at home. And would you believe that this ministry eventually grew to over 100 countries and has preached the gospel to well over 800,000 prisoners and counting? What could have been a source of guilt and shame for Chuck ended up being something that God would use in his life to bring thousands into the kingdom. And look, you might not have been to prison. You might not have had this crazy testimony. You might not have been the, I was so, I mean, I was out there, I was, I was into all this stuff and then God got me. You might not have that testimony, but that doesn't mean that you don't have experiences in your life that God can and will use. And so whatever you've been through, don't let that have power over you because as long as you let that stay in the dark, it's just a wasted experience. But when you bring it into the light, when you bring it to community, you say, Lord, I'm bringing this all out in front of you. I'm laying this to you. And I just pray, God, use me however you would use me. It doesn't have power over you anymore. It has the power and God will use that. And the Holy Spirit will meet you there. He will encourage you. He will equip you. I know it might be scary because you might not have ever talked about that with anybody before. And you planned to leave that in the closet till the day you die but the Holy Spirit will meet you there. He will help you, he will encourage you, he will equip you to go be a blessing to others in ways you could never imagine. And so as we wrap up this morning, it would be wrong of me to to leave here without asking you the question, have you experienced the Holy Spirit personally in your life? I'm not asking, do you know about him? I'm not asking if you sing about him. Do you experience him personally? Not Sunday mornings, not Wednesday nights, when you're in the quietness of your home, by yourself, have you, do, do you regularly meet with him? And if the answer is no, what in your life needs to change this morning? Maybe you need to return to the gospel message that you tried to graduate from a long time ago. Maybe you need to preach that to yourself daily and pray, God, please draw me into a deeper understanding of your saving truth. Forgive me for trying to move past that. Help me to just rest in the fact that you loved me, that you died for me, Jesus, and that you call me yours. Maybe you need to change your approach to reading his word. Maybe you just need to start. Right? Maybe that devotional, that Bible has been sitting on the nightstand gathering dust. It's okay, there's no day like today to start. I beg you to experience this, the riches that are in his word. Or maybe you need to change your approach. Maybe you need to come to scripture with this sense of expectation saying, Lord, please, Holy Spirit, meet me here. Show me the truth that I need for today to be a light for you in a dark and dying world. Show me what I need, God. 
Or maybe there's something in your past that you've been trying to keep from the Lord, you've been trying to keep in that closet, and maybe if you can just forget it, it'll go away and you never have to worry about it. Maybe, maybe today is the day to say, Lord, I'm giving that to you. I know that you brought me through that. I know that you rescued me from it, and I know that you have given me freedom. And, and I just pray that, Lord, you would use me in some way, shape, or form to bring that freedom to others. I don't know what it might look for, for you this morning. I, I don't know how the Lord may be moving in your heart. I don't know what he may be bringing you out of or going through, but I know every single one of us came in here this morning dealing with something. And so as the band comes up and we enter into a time of response, I just want to pray and I just want to, to ask, be responsive to the Lord. If you feel like he's been moving in your heart, if you feel like he has given you these experience or he's convicting you of something, don't let that moment go by. I pray that there's no sense of shame or guilt, but there would be hope and joy knowing that, that God wants to meet you personally. The God of the universe, who turns a rock into a pool of water, who splits seas, who causes mountains to shake, that God wants to meet you personally. Amen. That God loves you, he wants to help you. Would you stop keeping at arm's length this morning? And, and so I'm about, to, I'm about to pray, and I would ask that you would just respond however the Lord is leading you. I, we'll have people down here at the front to, to pray with you. And I, I, I just want you to understand this morning, when we hear the word of God, we are called to respond. And so please, whatever the Lord is leading you to do this morning, let's be obedient. Father, we love you and we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you that, that God, you care about us. You've come, you, you come to meet us, Lord, in, in everyday life. Like, it's so hard to wrap our heads around that, God. We admit that we are so finite, we forget. We push the gospel to the side. We push your word to the side. We, we so often forget the riches that are offered in your spirit, Lord. But would you help us remember this morning? Would you draw us into a deeper love of you just by how much we see who you are, by your character? And God, I pray that if you're moving in any hearts, if you're calling anybody into action into this room this morning, Lord, that they would be obedient to do so. Lord God, we love you and we praise you. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.